Hi, my name is David Lowry. I wrote and directed The Old Man and the Gun. When I was first conceiving of The Old Man and the Gun and thinking about how to translate this true story into a movie, I knew that the cop and the robber were going to have to meet, even though in real life they never did. John Hunt is a real guy. He was an advisor on the movie. He, he really did pursue Forrest Tucker, but they never actually crossed paths. John Hunt, where is he? There he is. Looks like your rainy day robber's out again. Laugh it up, Columbo. But because this was a movie, I just felt it had to happen. That's one of the things that you just want to see happen. And Heat is the perfect representation of that type of scene. How you doing? You know, the type of scene where you have two really great actors playing a cop and a robber who are in opposition to each other, who also like each other, who sit down and have a conversation in which you just learn how much they respect one another. It's that or we both better go do something else, pal. I don't know how to do anything else. Neither do I. I don't much want to either. Neither do I. It's just one of the greatest scenes of all time. I think Heat's one of the greatest movies of all time, period. So I was definitely tipping my hat towards it when I you know, conceived of that scene. But I also know that I am not Michael Mann and that my Cops and Robbers movie was not going to be Heat. And so I had to figure out a way to do it my own way. And it was probably the scene that got worked on the most all the way up until the day we shot it because there were versions of it where that confrontation led to a chase or led to an arrest or led to a more climactic confrontation because sometimes you just feel like that's what the audience is gonna wanna see or that's what the movie needs. And it never felt right doing that. I had so many versions of the script where that did happen and people liked them. People were like, great, it's, I'm glad you finally made the choice to have them like have a car chase after that scene. And the reason that they were both there at the same time kept changing. Sometimes I was okay with it being a coincidence. Other times I felt there needed to be like a stakeout aspect to it. There were all sorts of different variables, but the actual content of the scene was always kind of the same. So, you know, we finally settled on the script, you know, probably like two weeks out from shooting that scene. And finally I decided like, look, like we don't have time to shoot a, shoot a car chase anyway. Let's just have the scene be this confrontation and somehow it's gonna end. I don't know how it's gonna end, but it's gonna just end in a very nonchalant sort of way. There you go. And then we had the diner that we'd already previously established pretty thoroughly. When we shot the scene earlier in the film where Robert Redford and Sissy Spacek meet. What do you do then? Well, that's a secret. <laughs> oh, is it now? Yeah. And why is that? Well, because if I told you, you probably wouldn't want to see me again. Who said I was going to see you again? Would you? When you go back and watch that scene, we sort of like, block that scene so that you gradually understand the entire space. And at the time, you're not processing it that way, but you, we are sort of like introducing the entire geography of that diner so that later on, when we're back there again with John Hunt, you know exactly what's going on in terms of how the space works. I love, you know, when you have like a space that you know at that point in the film, like just being able to play around with it and kind of build a little sense of suspense and expectation in terms of two parties being in the space at the same time. And the idea that Forrest Tucker and John Hunt would both be there at the same time and one would be aware of it, the other one wouldn't. The way we blocked that scene was partially dictated by the diner itself, but also that's just how those scenes work. You just want to sort of like have the fun of seeing one person and realize something that the other person doesn't know. That's always just incredibly satisfying. And it had this hallway leading back to the restrooms, and then there was an exit in the back. And I was like, well, let's put the scene in this hallway so that they're at, you know, opposite ends of the hallway. And then at the end of it, Bob can just walk out the back door. And even then I was like, let's, and then maybe Casey can chase after him and then decide not to go after him. I didn't know how to end it after that, but I was like, we'll use that hallway. And we had to rebuild it on a stage because it wasn't actually big enough. And then hey. we just sort of started shooting it. Didn't I see you on TV? And halfway through the morning, I just remember telling Casey, don't try to like be a cop anymore, just be a fan. Oh, maybe? No, I think so. You were involved with that, what were you called? The Over the Hill Gang, right? Yeah. Yeah. Did you catch him? Just be delighted that this guy is here. Not yet. Hmm. You close? Oh, we're getting there. 
Excuse me, I don't want to be rude here, but straighten this out a little and bit. And maybe play it like you're maybe just meeting Robert Redford for the first time. Oh, yeah? Yeah. There you go, looking sharp. And so that's what he did, and that's what's in the movie. It's just like that look of sheer delight crossing his face. And that delight was all we needed. Like that trumps any sort of need for there to be a chase or for him to do his job as a police officer. It is just some guy being starstruck in the moment of meeting some guy who he's admired. Forced. I know what I'm doing. And that was all the scene needed. At that point, Robert Redford could walk out the back door, Casey could go back to his dinner, or didn't need anything else. The scene was so clearly over as soon as Bob walked out that back door. So that was one of those great days where you just don't know how something's gonna work, but then once all the pieces are there, it just clicks into place in just the right way. It's a nice reminder that if you have the right ingredients and just one little bolt of like inspiration in the moment that you can really make something special. Hi, my name is Eric Lin. I'm a New York-based cinematographer of films like Hearts Beat Loud and The Sound of Silence, which was in competition at Sundance this year. You know, for me, lighting is how you get into the subjectivity of a story. It's like, how are the visuals giving us access to the characters, to the story, to their arc? So for like, Hearts Beat Loud, I wanted the lighting to kind of track the emotional arc between Frank and his daughter. They're, you know, cohabitating, but in very kind of separate worlds. And, you know, I wanted the, the lighting to accentuate that kind of difference. So, you know, it's in these ways that I'm always trying to accentuate the subjectivity of the character. 